Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, I'm Denise Cosgrove, I'm the Chief Executive of Presbyterian Support Northern. We're really excited at Presbyterian Support Northern to bring this uh, lecture series to you. And what we've been doing, as you know, is um, we're about halfway through, so we've brought a group of leading thinkers, challengers, commentators together to actually share some intimate sessions with some question and answers throughout, uh, at the end of those so that we can actually discuss and debate and work out how we might collaborate better to improve the outcomes for our Tamariki, our children in New Zealand. This is a key focus for the government, as we know, but it's equally really, really dear to PSN's hearts. You will see in front of you the little booklets there which talk about our suite of services. So we have Shine, which is around domestic violence. We have Lifeline. We have um, Family Works, which is everything from social workers in schools to parenting in prisons. And we also have Enliven, which is about home-based support for people, generally older people, but also people with disabilities. So to us, it's really, really important uh, around this issue of child wellbeing. And we think that it's also a role for us outside of government to show some leadership on this topic and to encourage and, and facilitate a national conversation. Um, and this is why we've brought this lecture series to you. So today I'm really delighted uh, to have with us Professor Nicola Atwell, and she's our guest speaker. So Nicola is an Associate Professor in the Department of Sociology, Gender and Social Work at Otago University, which is my alma mater, I must say. Uh, and Nicola's one of those rare breeds. So not only is she a great academic, She's also got a deep history and experience as a practitioner. And being able to walk between those two worlds is actually a very unique, um, unique skill. And um, you worked for about 20 years in what was probably now the, one of the earlier iterations of Wauranga Tamariki. Uh, you stepped into lecture positions at Otago, then stepped out to work as a principal advisor in the Office of the Children's Commissioner before resuming, going back in 2012, to Otago as a senior lecturer in that department. But I think I've learnt lots of things from you this morning, and particularly around your passion for influencing policy and practice to improve the outcomes for children and young people exposed to adversity. Um, I think that it would be fair to say uh, that you're an acknowledged expert and sought-after commentator, even though you might not think that you are yourself. Uh, particularly around the areas of attachment theory and resilience. And resilience is a term that is starting to get increased currency, and I think it will be really great to understand a little bit, of, bit more about that. So today's title for this session is, as you can see on the board, Institutional and Practice Barriers to Reducing Child Poverty. So what we're going to do is Nicola's going to speak, We'll then uh, facilitate some question and answers. We do have microphones. We probably might not need them today. I'd like to thank Westpac. This is a really fantastic venue, and um, we're very appreciative of their support for this series. So I shall pass over to you, Nicholas. Thank you. Kia ora koutou. Um, some of my passion comes from the fact that um, I qualify for National Super at my next birthday, and I've said that I can't retire until things get better for children in New Zealand. Uh, so there is some urgency about this. <laughs> uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going, because I think it's really important that we have a shared understanding of what the issues are, I'm going to talk very quickly about the impact of child poverty and why it is so important to reduce it. I want to talk about the practice barriers, uh, starting at the, the kind of, with the, the base understanding that poverty is an exacerbating factor for a whole lot of other things that bring contact, people into contact with services. Then I'm going to talk about institutional barriers, uh, which will include some of the dominant discourses, our failure to recognise the cost of not doing something about it. And then I want to finish on a more positive note in terms of looking at the implications and what might be the way to, that we could move forward as a nation. Uh, so, just to, so that we're all got this top of mind, uh, income poverty, 200, these are the latest figures, 290,000 children, just 27%. It's more than one in four. 
Material hardship, and for those of you who are not familiar with the measure, these are really practical things like having a waterproof raincoat, children each having their own bed, um, having all your school uniform items. So these are really practical things that people are doing without. So that's 14% or 155,000. And of those living in poverty, 9% are in what is categorised as severe poverty. And the other thing is that often people like to think that, oh, it's, transition, it's a transition stage, it's not like that for the whole of their childhood. For three out of five children, it, this poverty is persistent. Um, and we have this level of poverty in the context of a nation marked by uh, its very high inequality. So we have one of the steepest gradients between the wealthy and the uh, poor in the world, in the, in the developed world. So, in the, and there is a lot of literature around uh, how that um, has an adverse impact across the whole of society. So what does it mean for children who are growing up in poverty? It has an adverse impact, obviously, on nutrition, but more beyond that, poor nutrition affects ability to, to study, it affects growth, and it has a long-term effect on um, physical and mental health. Uh, housing quality, and we, that's a huge issue, you, I'm sure people are familiar with it, uh, lots of documented evidence of the long-term adverse impact on health. Uh, one of the most compelling areas that I think we need to pay attention to is that the research uh, both in New Zealand and internationally, shows that children in poverty, are, it has an extremely adverse impact on their ability to engage with education. So they may be going to school, that doesn't mean they're learning, and there is a pattern of early disengagement. And I'll come back to the point uh, to why I think that's so important uh, a little bit later. But the other thing is that all of the stuff that those of us you know, who, who are better off, take for granted, like we might grit our teeth when our children want to try a new sport or have some lessons, but we find the way to pay for that. These children miss out on all of those activities. And for children who perhaps aren't doing so well at school, those activities are a really important part of what can make a difference for them. And I'll again come back to that when I talk about Resilience. So these are the normal, ordinary, everyday things that are about children having fun, but are also about children developing a sense of competence and learning good social skills. They miss out on those. We know that exposure to poverty um, throughout childhood has a lifelong negative impact. Uh, there's well, very good do documented evidence of that. But we also know that short-term or intermittent exposure may also have a long-term impact. Uh, so that um, it, it's not just the children who spend their whole childhood. Now, this is, ah, there it is. Um, this is a diagram that was developed, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, the Office of the Children's Commission and the um, unit at Otago University who've done the health monitor. Uh, analysis over several years now. This is their latest. What they, the point they're making is that some children are at greater risk. So obviously the very young, uh, because all of their development is potentially being compromised. Uh, but also the research tells us that intervention in that group has the greatest reward, greatest return. Uh, Māori and Pacifica children, it's really important that to understand this is not a characteristic of being a Māori or Pacifica person, it's to do with processes for Māori around colonisation and the intergenerational transmission uh, of various forms of disadvantage for Pacifica. It's about migration and uh, the um, way in which migrants were welcomed as a labour force and then when things changed, uh, we're no longer so welcome, and that has had an impact. Uh, children and sole parent families, Treasury likes to identify this. It's really important that we don't see this as solely about being a sole parent. I worked with a woman 
who had raised, successfully raised four sons on her own, and she would be livid every time there was this attention to uh, negativity. What we know is that it is hard to be a salt parent. It's hard to be the, the one and only doing it all, but it's the isolation and the poverty that is actually what makes it so hard. It's not sole parent in and of itself. Um, and then we know that it's the children in severe and persistent poverty where the greatest harm is incurred. So it's a complex picture. Um, and for anyone who, who doubts uh, the, ver the veracity of, of this information, there are countless reports um, that have been produced over the years from Child Poverty Action um, Group, uh, Christian Social Services Monitor um, did a vulnerability monitor for several years. They've um, stopped that now. Uh, Ministry of Social Development Household Incomes a report every year. The Office of the Children's Commission. It goes on and on. So what, what's important, and Denise mentioned this word resilience. I can't resist the little um, diagram uh, which picks up this idea that people tend to use this concept of resilience to say, well, children get over things, or it doesn't matter that much because they're children. Actually, that's not true. Children are not born resilient. You only develop resilience in the face of um, challenge or disadvantage, and it's a process. It's not a characteristic that you are born with more or less of. And if you are going to be resilient in the face of disadvantage and challenge, then there need to be more protective factors in your life than risk factors. So poverty um, is a significant risk factor. The reason it's such a significant risk factor is because it reduces children's access to social capital. Social capital, education is our primary means of social capital. That's what allows people to move from positions of disadvantage into better positions. And what we've seen is that in New Zealand, that idea of the self-made, and I will use the gendered term deliberately, self-made man, has become inaccessible. In the 70s, it was possible. My brother is an example. Uh, he had a learning disability that wasn't <coughs> dealt with appropriately. He left school without any, passing any formal examin examinations. He now has a, a massive diploma in agricultural engineering. He's very much self-taught, um, and he's probably the wealthiest member of our family because he works in um, product innovation in ag agricultural engineering. That's no longer possible because... Without formal education, our young people are not getting into the employment market. He was able to get out and get a job and work his way up. That is not happening. We, our youth unemployment rates are still very high. And if they are not transitioned from programs into work, and many of them aren't, then they are headed down a pathway, potentially, of lifetime disadvantage. But the other protective factors, over and above edu education, are all relationship-based. They are about children having people in their lives who believe in them and support them inside their family and beyond their family. So the more, the richer your relational networks, the greater your resilience. And it's that simple. Uh, and that's the thing that we often overlook. So education <coughs> and relational networks. Without that social capital, there is no pathway out of poverty. And it's not just that those people believe in you, it's that they open doors for you. They find, you know, someone speaks to someone and a job materialises. I mean, I don't know what it's like in Auckland because it's so much bigger, but in Dunedin, it's the who knows who that gets jobs. Even for those of us um, who are experienced and qualified, it makes a difference. It's that much more so if you're a young person starting out and particularly if you don't kind of tick all the boxes of what people are looking for. And what we now know is that this is passing from one generation to the next. And so 
If you're interested in that, um, the two books I would recommend would be Max Rash books, Inequality in New Zealand, and Boston and Chapel's um, Child Poverty. And in one of those books, I think it's Max Rash books, there's a very good chapter on what's happening in terms of the intergenerational transmission of educational disengagement, um, and, and that this is becoming a major factor for some families. So that's the, that's the nasty picture. That's what we're dealing with on a daily basis in New Zealand right now. Now, the problem is that where these families show up is at social service agencies, a whole range of them. But at that level, and I'm calling that the micro level of the, the immediate sort of child and family environment, um, all we can do is ameliorate the worst impacts by making sure people have their entitlements, things like um, food, uh, food parcels, uh, advocating perhaps to get better accommodation. But all of you who work in that field will know this is hard work and it takes a lot of time and you're in competition with other people who have equally needy uh, families that are needing these resources as well. But the other factor is that poverty is a really significant stressor. So families living in poverty are constantly under pressure. And what we know are that particularly in the care and protection field, when families present, but also across a whole range of services, there are three big issues that tend to be the presenting problems. Parental mental health issues, alcohol and substance abuse, family violence. And of course some families have all three. But the elephant in the room is that they're also dealing with poverty. And that if you're living in a situation um, which is volatile in relation to family violence, then the fact that um, you're having to make decisions or there are choices to be made about bills is going to fuel situations that are already tense. Uh, and my worry is that given that complexity, given that intersection of difficulties, the attention gets focused on the adults and we don't, it, it's like the whole thing of what's happening to the children is kind of too difficult. And we kind of rely on, if we're working with the parents and getting things back on track, it will, all, it will be better for the children. It isn't that simple. And we need to be seeing the children in their own right and thinking about what access to networks of support do they have. I'm not in any way advocating that they should come into care. The results for children who are raised in the care system are actually worse than for many of the children uh, who remain with their families. Uh, the solution is not removing them. The solution is addressing the issues effectively within the whole family uh, and not losing sight of the children in the process. It's almost like we've become conditioned to accept uh, that poverty is a fact of life and that it's not something we have it within our power to do anything about. Uh, the other thing that's operated is in this uh, period since the 80s of increasing <coughs> pressure, the threshold for access to services is incredibly high. Um, when you have high thresholds, then lots of people fall through the gaps. Uh, once if people do get access to services, we've got people are carrying very high workloads. Uh, some of your interventions are time limited, so you're allowed to work with a family for six weeks. You don't solve this stuff in six weeks, and in fact in six weeks you're lucky if you can even get extra support around the family to help them as they go forward. And a lot of the contracting, and I think the climate is changing, but it needs to change and quickly, a lot of the contracting is siloed, it's narrow. So you have an agency like, Presbyter uh, like Family Works, which is an umbrella agency with different contracts under that. So even within one agency, it's difficult to get a holistic wrap around, around the family because you know your social worker in schools is working under one contract and your family start work is working under another. They're the same families and it, it's a crazy way to go and hopefully um, we are beginning to realise this. Uh, when we're talking about children, you can't work just with the family. You need consistency across the other environments they engage in, uh, particularly school and community. 
Uh, so the language I, you'll hear me use is networks of support. It's not about having a worker who's in there supporting. It's for children. It's about uh, facilitating uh, access to resources at multiple levels. Uh, the other thing is that we've been talking about coordination and collaboration as the way of responding to these challenges. Uh, in 2003, I wrote a paper called If It's Such a Good Idea, How Come It Doesn't Work? And uh, that paper could have been written today. It's still, we are still not good at doing this, and there are lots of systemic reasons why, but there are also uh, you know, some of our thinking, if you want something done well, do it yourself, kind of gets in the way. Uh, but also, our, our, often our workloads aren't set up in ways that create the space to do this and do it well, because it takes time. Uh, so we're moving in that direction, I think, with um, seeing more sort of decision-making forums that facilitate that coordinated response. Uh, they, you know, they're in their early stages, but hopefully they'll get there. So when, so what I'm saying is, at the practice level, we can't solve this problem. You can't, and certainly you don't solve poverty at the at the micro practice level. So then that means we have to think about what are the institutional barriers, what are, what's the systemic stuff. And so for me, neoliberalism is kind of the elephant in the room. Um, I have to remind myself when I'm lecturing students that they don't know any other way. Well, I lived in a New Zealand that wasn't characterised. I spent most of my growing up in a New Zealand that wasn't characterised by neoliberalism. It wasn't perfect, but we didn't have the marked inequality and we didn't have the um, intense focus on individualism and competition that has come with neoliberalism. It's, it, the message is... Uh, individual responsibility, um, there's a lot of rhetoric around uh, people choosing uh, lifestyles of welfare dependency. People don't choose that. It's forced on them by circumstances. We, you know, there is a lot of talk about um, parents making bad choices. Well, when you're really stressed, it's incredibly difficult uh, to give up the things that you use as props. And yes, they are bad choices, but that shouldn't mean that the children have to pay the price for that. I think there have to be other ways of approaching those issues. So I think neoliberalism, in 1999, I wrote an article um, called uh, New Zealand Children in the 1990s, Beneficiaries of the New Right Economic Policy, with a question <coughs> mark. In that paper, I concluded that children were not being well served, that the rhetoric that the solution to poverty was parental employment. I would have loved to have been proved wrong, but sadly I have not been proved wrong. Uh, many of our children in poverty have parents in work. It has not proved to be the solution. The other dominant discourse we have in this country is family, what is called family sovereignty. The idea that family is private and you only interfere when things are really, really bad. Well, that's a bit sad because what that means is that the damage is done for the children by the time we get involved. And all the research tells us that early intervention is way more effective. And this has happened because we've polarised, um, we've had a situation which is kind of like, you don't do anything until it's so bad and when it's that bad it has to go, for example, to Oranga Tamariki. So Oranga Tamariki has been completely overloaded and unable to respond to all of the referrals, and lots of families have fallen in the gaps in the meantime. And so that, that thinking needs to shift, uh, that it's not a bad thing to get alongside families and support them, and if you do that in an early stage, you're much more likely to be able to do that in a supportive way that doesn't involve statutory intervention. And that's uh, where I'll be going when we look at the way forward. And the other thing is the myths and misperceptions. So Boston and Chapel um, identify this in their um, uh, book. They talk about, there's about nine myths and misperceptions, you know, the, the, starting with there is no poverty in New Zealand, um, and that patently is not true, to, you know, that it's parents' bad choices, all of those kind of things. 
that have allowed us to sit comfortably or, or allowed some of us to sit comfortably in a place that says, you know, this is a problem that only affects those people over there, not my business, I don't have any responsibility for this. Um, and it, it is actually about our whole social well-being. It's about the well-being of our entire society, not just individuals. Um, so I've already mentioned about service provision. Now, the other thing is I got really excited when the government, the pre starting with the previous government, started to use the language of social investment. Because when I was at OCC, this was what we were promoting. Um, in fact, we developed a whole model called Te Ara Tukutuku, which would have facilitated early intervention and prevention using an investment model for the well-being of children and families. But unfortunately, they got wedded. Somehow, the whole notion of social investment got subverted to being about targeting, finding out the most at risk and investing in them. That is not the social investment model that is used in other parts of the world. In other parts of the world, it's a model that's used to ensure good social provision that allows you to identify the families that might need targeted services. Um, the other thing that we have failed to do is to accurately assess the cost of our failure to intervene. So we have high rates, high rates of imprisonment. Keeping a man in prison is one of the most expensive, or woman, expensive forms of investment, and it's the least effective. And in fact, some people leave prison more damage than they went in. Uh, so we're spending at the wrong end. If you want to reduce the number of people in prison, then the research shows that you've got to get in in naught to five, and, but also you've got to make a difference in the teen years because that's a wonderful w window of opportunity. Uh, we're carrying very high costs in terms of delivery of um, physical health services and mental health services. Conditions that are avoidable. The longitudinal studies are showing that the children um, who were raised in the m more adverse circumstances are showing up with significant health issues like heart disease in their 30s and 40s. This is New Zealand research, uh, that they don't live as long. And that has a, um, a cost associated with it as well. And the other um, loss, which the people who write about inequality talk about, is that your whole society becomes fragmented and, can, and uh, we jockey for position and we are critical of people who are not doing well. We, we create... Um, a, a pretty intense environment that allows, for example, the articulation of some very aggressive responses <coughs> to our offenders, people wanting uh, tougher and tougher penalties. Um, so we're not, what I'm questioning is, are we failing to assess this and go, hang on a minute, maybe we've got this wrong? Or is it that we have come to accept the inevitability of those things and, are, and don't have the belief that we could be doing things differently, that we could adjust our social policy settings in a way that addressed those issues? And so I'm not sure whether it's, it's probably both, that we're not accurately assessing the cost and then we also, I think, are suffering from a difficulty to believe that it could be different. So what are the implications? Now this diagram, it, it's a bit difficult to see, but it shows the population profile. And what it captures is that going forward, instead of having more people at, in the younger ages, and in the work, and the, that bulges as people in the working, you know, working age, with a reducing number of elderly, this is what we're going to have. A very large, as the baby boomers age, a very large cohort of elderly, a reduced cohort of people of working age, and still quite a substantial number of children. Now, to support that, you can't afford to have 27% of your children being compromised. 
because we need them to be active participants in society to manage the challenges that will be presented by having that kind of demographic profile. We need people who will be able to support and work with the elderly, but we also need people paying taxes so that the social um, provision that we make for our elderly can be on it. I suspect they're going to have to rejig it, um, but I would hope that we wouldn't go back uh, completely beyond our commitment to support it. The other thing is that the bubble in the middle is the median age. That's the halfway point. Half the people are below that age, half the people are above it. It's going to go up. And that's a, a very significant demographic factor. Um, and we can't be sustaining the current high level of negative spend. So I'm talking about prisons, I'm talking about mental health and physical health costs. Um, at a time when we're <coughs> reducing the number of people who will be available to support that through participation in the workforce. Uh, we can't afford to squander the potential that, it, that is our children. So, the government can't solve properties associated with child poverty in isolation. Like they, they can't do it alone. Uh, the current government's committed to poverty reduction and an investment approach to funding services. I think that there's been a significant shift in thinking. Ministries, and I'm meaning I'm referring here to government ministries, are seeking uh, partnerships with non-government organisations to develop new and innovative approaches. This is happening in small ways at the moment, but I am hopeful that uh, it will gain traction as we get, are able to demonstrate some success. Although there will be some government funding to support the delivery of contracts by non-government organisations, non-government funding allows for innovation and flexibility in service delivery. So where you see really innovative projects, often that money has come from elsewhere. So on My Voice, which is the new advocacy group for children in care, is a partnership between the government um, and four major, major philanthropic trusts who wanted to commit to a long-term project. So that was a shift in thinking. Um, so I think that one of the challenges is we've got a philanthropic sector. They've um, been a lifesaver for a lot of organisations. But at the moment, often that is in a, a single grants or grants for a specific purpose. And an enormous amount of energy goes into chasing those grants. And so I think we need to bring those funders, both corporate and the, the philanthropic bodies, on side around the idea of an investment model that allows for sustainable funding into some projects. Uh, because in the US, it's really interesting because the neoliberal stuff started in the US. In the US, there is a much stronger philosophy that if you're doing well, you should be contributing back. And the way they do that is through uh, large philanthropic trust. And I've seen some really exciting projects funded in that way in partnership with universities who do the evaluation and that's what's allowed it to go. I'd love to see some of that work happening in New Zealand. As someone employed in a university who's chased research grants, I've stopped I've stopped doing it because it's a waste of energy. Big grants don't go to people like me. They go to the hard sciences, they go into medicine, uh, they go into people who um, aren't perhaps quite as radical as me, dare I say it. Um, but, you know, that's, but that's how they've got around it in the States, is that Rather than having the grant system that we've got, they've got a, a wider range of sources and they have this um, ability to work in partnerships. So um, there's been some, uh, Bruce Perry um, did some work in the um, early childhood area that was funded in exactly that way. There's been other major projects. But we're not going to get to that point unless we change those dominant discourses. We have to ask ourselves, 
if we want to continue living in a country that's characterised by inequality that significantly disadvantages our most vulnerable citizens, and if not, what happens next? Where do we go from here? So I, when in that paper that I wrote way back in 1999, I argued that we needed to be shifting our social policy focus toward an emphasis on connectedness and, on, and inclusion. So there are good theoretical and research-based foundations for making that shift. Uh, it needs to be based on the recognition that children are active participants in families, communities and society. You can't abdicate responsibility and say it's down to the parents because that way we will never move forward. We need, we all benefit, whether you have a child or not, by the time you have retired and are in receipt of national super, it's be taxpayer dollars that are paying that. So it's all, they are they're our children. But more important than that, I'm really concerned about the erosion that's gone on with um, paid employment being privileged over parenting. I would rather have support a sole mum to be at home, particularly with her preschoolers, and doing the very best she can than for her to be chasing multiple part-time jobs, stressed out of her brain, her kids... Um, you know, having to wait while she battles traffic to get her to pick them up from the daycare centre. Like, that is my idea of how. And lots of mums are doing this. And I think we need to think about not just the mums, but the dads. The number of men that I've talked to have got to a certain stage and realised the children have grown up and they've missed it. Parenting is an investment in the future. Yes, we want people in paid employment, but we, want, we don't want that to be at the expense of parenting. And I think we're dangerously close to that. People are to, talking about the poor mental health of our young people, and this isn't just the kids that I'm talking about. This is across the board. I talk to people, guidance counsellors, in some of the, the uh, privileged schools in our, in, in our town, Dunedin's well served by private education, they're deeply concerned about the mental health of the young people. We have a significant number of our students on uh, medication for so anxiety, depression. I think we have to ask where this is coming from. This isn't just about how the youth are. This is something about the world that we created for them to grow up in and some of the gaps that are there for them. So I think we have to really think about that. Um, and I've mentioned this idea of reconceptualising responsibility for children, that our children, and that we share responsibility whether we, or not we choose to become parents. So what I'm sort of suggesting as the way forward is social investment using a public health model. So that, what is a public health model? Basically, it's a triangle shape. At the base, you have universal services. And I've got a diagram just to clarify this on the next slide. Um, so that's our health and our education are well-funded, well-set up, and our workers are, have the training that allows them, wherever they are, to recognise a family that may be in need or where there may, um, there may be vulnerabilities to identify that at an early stage and create pathways for those people to more intensive support. And that means we have to have a range of community-based services with accessible entry points and preferably agencies able to do the wraparound. So if a midwife comes across a mum who's living with family violence, uh, who uh, perhaps um, isn't well set up in terms of moving to employment, later in, on, uh, trapped in poor housing, poverty. We, how do you, you need to find somewhere. What happens is a lot of the midwives won't think the only thing they can do is refer to Oranga Tamariki. They don't want to jeopardise the relationship with that mother, so they don't. But they don't do anything else. 
So there need to be readily identifiable services in the family that that mum can be introduced to, who will welcome her and walk with her for as long as needed, uh, and help her with all of the issues she is facing, and have the potential to reach out to the violent partner and engage him in the journey to change. So it's, it's getting rid of our simplistic notions and having services able to meet families where they are and address all of the issues. So if you've got that secondary level, then at the tip of the iceberg you have what are called the tertiary services. So these are the high cost, high intensity. So that's where Oranga Tamariki is, it's where the police are, it's where um, your more intensive health services and mental health services are. If the idea of a public health model is that if you get that structure right, then you have less people needing the high end because you've intervened early and altered the pathway. So this is what, on this side, this is, catches the idea, because public health model came out of health, of course, but we're borrowing it. Um, in the medical model, you focus on an individual. What's wrong with that person? Diagnose and treat. With a public health model, you look at the whole population, what are the issues and how can we most effectively intervene. So alongside your universal services, it also opens up the possibility of campaigns such as the It's Not OK, family violence campaign, the Never Never Shake a Baby, those kinds of um, ways of reaching a maximum number of people with positive messaging. And the public health pyramid, that's... I've, I've chopped it to make it big enough, um, but that's the idea, that it, that's the model that we use to think about where we put our resources and to guide that. So my concern is that um, people see that as um, idealistic and expensive. But my argument is, can we afford not to move in that direction? Uh, there are extremely high financial and social costs associated with the way things are being. We are already spending a huge amount of money. Um, all of the research um, evidence points in the direction of prevention, early intervention as the solution. So the Gluckman report, um, the, the longitudinal studies, there is just a wealth of evidence from this country, let alone if you go to the overseas literature. Um, and the challenge is that, yes, you would have to start investing in this approach while you're still uh, funding your prisons and all the rest of it. But within 10 to 15 years, you could be reducing the number of people needing that high-level intervention. That's longer than a political cycle. You can't do this in three years. You can't turn it around in three years. So it's it's finding a way to have these conversations so that they are not totally uh, <coughs> governed by those political processes and by the need to uh, catch votes. But my, my, the question that I want to leave you is, is what have we got to lose to, if we move in the direction of trying to do it differently? So that's me. Um, you talked about how paid employment's being privileged over parenting. So I'm just wondering what's your thoughts around the working for families and how that's playing out and is supposed to be helping families in paid employment get out of poverty, but is it exacerbating it? I don't think it's exacerbating it, but it's a really complicated system. And I think it. I think some families just opt out because they can't, face the hassle of it, and so therefore it's a less than perfect system. I mean, years ago, there was a, um, I think it was Titmus, a, a UK commentator, who, who basically said we didn't need a benefit system, we could run it all out of IRD, what you do is you set the level at what you think is a living wage, if you're below that, you get topped up, if you're above that, you pay tax. <laughs> and it strikes me as... Um, you know, something that would be worth investigating as, a, as a, a simpler way. Because my experience, and, and I'm talking um, partly from a, a family perspective here, 
If you're a parent, with, particularly with preschool children, navigating working for families and the early childhood subsidies is a complete and utter nightmare. I can't get my head around all of the different uh, ways in which those packages are done up and the steps that people have to take. And then you throw child support into that as an added complication, and that's real messy. And so I think a lot of families are really struggling, so it's perhaps not as effective as it could be. Um, and it doesn't help, obviously, the people who are benefit dependent. Um, and I don't think that that's a healthy distinction. I don't think it serves us well. Yeah, thanks, Nicola. That was a really interesting talk. Uh, the question I want to ask is one about an issue you didn't raise, and, but I think it's on the table. I, I happen to be in the same business as you are, teaching social workers. Uh, and I'm just feeling that the professional model of practice has collapsed. That we are trying to perfect a person who's a super person, uh, that we have, we are not, not never going to be prepared to pay them what they're worth. Uh, and that the agencies are actually lobbying government to create a bigger barrier between the, stru the, in the in the workforce structure, which is basically trying to validate the notion that a volunteer is a well-intended good person, and we should reward them. So I'm not saying that it's collapsing because uh, they won't be well enough trained or they will, won't be well enough skilled, but that no one's been going to be prepared to recognise the skill sets and, the, and, the, and the, the fortitude that they bring to the job. The only people we recognise are volunteers, and somehow we've got to get those volunteers up to a point where they perform at a more powerful, uh, effective level. Yeah. I think social work um, lost its way. Uh, and, I mean, and I've been... I started in my first frontline position in 1977, so I think I'm in a good position to observe this. Um, <laughs> under the pressure that build up, I think we social work's always been pragmatic in New Zealand. Like we were late to, to recognising that people needed some specific training to do this job well. Um, and so it became very pragmatic and it got it started to get defined by your job description. So you were employed to do a role and and they would employ social workers to do that, but they'd say, this is what you're going to be doing. And there's still some pressure around that. So part of, I think part of the challenge is we, as, um, as those of us who identify with that profession, need to be really clear about articulating what it is that we bring that is unique and that counts as expertise. And Because I've observed a very interesting thing. I got a master's in social work as a young person. I was too young to go into front line, so I went and got my social work qual. So I started out with a master's qualification. Over the years, I added um, a postgraduate diploma in child psychotherapy, and then I got a PhD. And then I got labelled, I got promoted to associate professor. At the, each of those last two points, people's attitude toward me changed. So I was working in Wellington at the Office of the Children's Commission when I graduated with my PhD. People that I had been dealing with all along suddenly related to me differently because I had doctor in front of my name. It somehow legitimated what I was saying. I haven't changed a lot of what I've been saying. For some of this I would have been saying way back when, in the 70s. So there's something about perception and I think what we're trying to do where we teach social work is hold on to that idea of social workers with a broad range of skill, who, um, but educating them to understand that when they take their first job, there's a whole lot more they're going to have to find out. And we're trying to talk to employers about how you transition peak graduates into your workforce and how you support them to bring the knowledge they've got and develop that for that particular environment. But I also think that we're looking at, it is a generic qualification. Once people find their home in terms of, of why, where they want to practice their social work, the chance to come back and get an additional qualification that allows them to claim that specialist expertise. But also as part of that professional development journey that nurtures us and keeps us going in what is a very tough profession. 
But then there's that wider issue of ensuring that people, particularly policy makers, understand that actually we do know what we're talking about and we're not a whole bunch of idealistic, unrealistic or um, NGOs pushing their own barrow, which is the pushback that I've heard. Because I say, why don't you talk to the people on the front line? Why, why are you up here missing the point of, of what's actually going on? And, and the part of the resistance is, oh, they're just lobbying because they, they believe in their service and they want to keep it going. I mean, that's a crazy idea. And so I think there's a whole level at, of, of work that needs to go on, but no one's going to do it for us, so I think we have to start claiming that territory. I say to my students, you need to be able to answer. If someone says to you, so you're a social worker, what does that mean? You have to have an answer. You have to be able to talk about what it is you bring. And the one thing that I would argue is unique to social work that no other profession carries to the same degree is that ecological model. We understand that children are nested in families, families are nested within communities and are connected to other systems like schools, and then there's a macro system around that which has a direct and indirect impact. And it's that view that makes our take on what needs to happen different. It's different to a lawyer, it's different to a psychologist, and, and I think we need to promote that as our expertise. That's what we bring. That's what's unique. And, I, and yeah, I, I suppose I'm just getting a bit long in the tooth. And, and my feeling is we need to be arming our students, equip them to work with the challenges that they are going to face in that workforce. But also challenge the organisations around how they are inducting New, particularly new grads, or any new person into the role. Um, and we'd, I'd like to convince the government that you, to fund an internship scheme. Or go back to the, um, the units they used to have, the student units that they used to have within health and Oranga Tamariki. Hi, um, I'm Jenny. Um, I... I'm really interested in your ideas about, um, well, for me, if, if children spend so many years of their lives in our schools, how can the school be, and I'm a public health worker, um, from a, how can the schools become a setting which the education department or education ministry shares with all of the, the kind of wraparound services that you're talking about? Um, because because we all know teachers teach and they're educated to be educators, and that's a certain thing, just as social work's a certain thing, just as public health is. And I don't think public health models are the be all and end all. I think a lot of tweaking and reinventing could be done there. Um, but yeah, so because I'm thinking that's where cho all of our children spend their time there. And if we could share that space, and the structures, this is all about structures, if the structures can be changed and this policy window of opportunity that Chris Hipkins has opened and we can grab hold of it and throw our balls through, maybe it would end up somewhere helpful for what you're talking about. I've long, yeah, I've long had the vision of schools as community hubs. We've seen some exceptional examples of that, Victory Village and Nelson. Um, and this is where... Um, and it's also a, a model that's been used in other countries, where because schools are located usually in the community that they serve, uh, because it's where children spend a critical amount of their day, it's the logical site for co-location of services, but also to supplement your teaching staff with a range of auxiliary staff. As someone trained in child psychotherapy, I had this vision once of every school having a playroom and access to a, a, therap a child therapist. So that when a kid turned up in that state that they do, uh, where you know you're going to have the teacher knows they're going to have hell all day, they could ring up someone and say, look, can you come and, come and spend some time with so-and-so? They'll take them off to the playroom, have an hour with them, reintegrate them back in the classroom, away they go. Um, that was just one of my little fantasies. But So I wouldn't just have social workers in schools, I'd, and I'd have social workers in schools, I'd have them in all schools, but then I'd also have people with those more 
counselling therapeutic, co-locate with health services, so that you make this accessible and also um, closer cooperation between early childhood and um, primary, for example. I think uh, there's some, been some exciting co-location of facilities and teen parent units. I think we could extend that idea. So I would see your school as your natural site to, to start doing this different way of working. Now, the, one of the things that intrigues me is that in the Vulnerable Children Act, health and education and some, a whole lot of other government agencies were given responsibility, for, statutory responsibility for vulnerable children, including children in care. Now, a lot I think that a lot of people in those services have no idea. They have a responsibility. They have a responsibility that goes beyond picking up the phone and making a notification. They actually have a responsibility to be responding to those needs at the level that they are at, not waiting until it's so bad they can make that notification and then blame Oranga Tamariki for not doing anything about it. It's too late. Oranga Tamariki only picks up the cases where damage is done and can be proven to have been done. Why are we waiting? For that to happen, it's in my view, it's it's insane. But it's it, and it's and I find it really difficult to stomach that we would sit back. I mean, the biggest problem is not abuse, physical ab abuse or sexual abuse. The biggest problem in this country is neglect, and neglect does long term damage. It's not a benign form of child maltreatment. It's a it, it's an extremely pernicious form of child maltreatment. Um, and the solution isn't removal of children. The solution is engagement with families and whānau and supporting them on a journey to change. It doesn't matter what the presenting issue is. In my view, that's the challenge. Um, but too much of our services are ambulance at the bottom of the cliff after the event. Yeah. So schools, for me, is the place to start. And I'd like to see education embrace that. Now we've much run out of time, so um, I'm conscious that obviously uh, we've back, we've got some other people coming on <laughs> here. So um, I'd just personally like to thank you all for coming along here today, um, and particularly to Westpac who have hosted this session. Um, but more importantly, I think there's been so many key takeouts, Nicola, thank you very, very much. I've learnt lots. I mean, the key messages for me are let's not lose sight of the children. That whole concept of networks of support is really, really interesting. And one of the areas that we've been looking at as well is around you know, trying to lift the capability of the system and the sector rather than focus on the micro level of response, which we will naturally do through our service suite. I think the other challenging thing for me personally was seeing the, the blip on the age demographic graph and thinking, I'm one of those, you know, at the low end of the baby boomers, yeah. and 27% of our children are compromised at the moment. And so, you know, what's going to be the outcome as a result of that? So thank you all for coming along. I would like to thank Bronwyn and John and the PSN team for supporting this. You'll see that you've got a list of who our next speakers are. We're about halfway through, so please do come along. But most importantly, I want to thank Nicola. So thank you so much for your huge generosity, your openness. I think it's a very well-rounded presentation. We've got you know, great context, great defi definitions, I liked your models, and then left us with lots and lots of thought-provoking challenge. So thank you. Let's all give Nicola a big round.